you think, oh, here I go again, and it's back to that situation. All the pressure starts to build up on you. And this game's made or break for me because it was Premier League as well. I just couldn't wait to, to try and impress and try and create something. The game just kind of took care of itself after that. Chris, uh, good to see you and uh, great to have the chance to learn more about your story. So let's go all the way back to when you were growing up in the North East. What kind of a kid were you and how did your love of the game start way back then? Yeah, uh, I think because my dad played football in goal, I used to always go to all these games and then kind of three, four, five, six year old, I would be in like tiny tots playing football and then just a happy kid, just wanted to enjoy life playing football with your mates and I think back then in the days you were playing the streets a lot more and on the backfield and I just I couldn't get a really a ball away from my feet. And you were a big Sunderland fan as a kid, is that right? Yeah, so dad was a Sunderland fan so he took me to a lot of the games, not on the nighttime games but more on a Saturday weekend games and I, I loved going to watch the Sunderland games. I think Niall Quinn, Kevin Phillips were, were, were my heroes at the time and Gavin McCann as well and just, they just had a really good team at that stage and the Stadium of Light became a big vocal point and a big part of my future. And playing football while watching your boyhood heroes, was there a moment personally where you realised, hang on a minute, I'm, I'm not a bad player myself and you know, suddenly aware of scouts looking at you, that kind of thing? Yeah, so when scouts started watching us, I was just on my boyhood boy club teams and enjoying playing football just like any other kid. Uh, fans, uh, not fans, uh, parents shouting on and things like that and just just enjoying scoring goals and having fun and trying to be the best player and obviously with, when scouts become involved and you see the coach with the long jackets with uh, a badge on, you know that it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a scout there and you're trying to impress them. And one of those scouts from Newcastle liked what they saw what do you remember of that and um, did that cause you, your dad, any you know, second thoughts at the time as a mad Mackham? No, yeah, well obviously I, ha I, had a, I had a couple of trials with Sunnan and they didn't take us on so I had a bit of a bitter taste in my mouth at the time that they didn't take us so when Newcastle came up and approached us, uh, after a couple of years uh, I, was, I was actually quite happy and impressed and obviously the facilities that Newcastle had, the manager, the Alan Shearer and Gary Speed and players like that were just overwhelming so I couldn't wait to just have a chance of just impressing Newcastle Academy and Newcastle United. I was going to say Newcastle under Bobby Robson at that time were, were challenging weren't they in Europe at the time. Was everything for you about you know making that step up to the reserves and then that dream of the first team was that a realistic for you as a young lad? I think as a young lad you just I was just just really happy to be a ball boy at the time just to be on the stage and just enjoy waving the Champions League flag like I did and just just be in awe of the, 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 the stadium and the players like, like they were and it was always a goal but the, I think at that stage I didn't really just want to put too much pressure on you of trying to get to a reserve player I mean I was there from 9 to 16 so at that stage you just enjoy playing under 9s under 12s under 10s and just, just enjoy playing football to be honest. And there is that day, it comes for every young lad trying to make their way. And can you, can you take us back to that day, Chris, where you know, the, the dream was crushed? What can you remember of the day you were released at 16? Yeah, you kind of get a little feeling that you're not getting that step up to the reserves like we talked about just there. Like you're always just with your age group. And then obviously a letter came through the door, not, nothing else, not a sit down chat or anything. It was more of a letter. My dad opened the letter because it was. Uh, signature to him and it just basically said that they're not retaining us, they don't want to keep a hold of us but there is exit trials the, the, and they'll keep an eye out for us in the future but a lot, that, 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 that route didn't really go very well and the exit trials were tough to take because I wasn't really a developed 16 year old, I was very underdeveloped and not really a man at, at that time and it took us so long to, to get to the development stage which was I think was 18ish, something like that. So as a young lad trying to find his way in the world, how did it affect you at the time? You got away from football completely for a time, didn't you? Yeah, so I took a, I took a step away because I didn't really want to go back to boys football because it's, it's, it's quite embarrassing really because it, you, you're being released by Newcastle where you've been always known as that person who was at Newcastle and then you, then you can go to a boys club team and then you, do you really look very good, do you look good and it just felt a bit embarrassing at the time so I just took a step away from it and went to college and just tried to focus on a bit of studies because you have to have goals at, at, after, after life to, to try and focus on something else. And as you say you went to college and part time jobs, I suppose you're, you're doing what every other 16 year old does. Um, what's your memories of that time and, and 
Did you just want to completely forget about it or was the, the ambition always to go back into football? No, I think the reason why I went to the college that I did was because I knew that it was going to be a lot of sport and football involved uh, three or four times a week. So I knew I could keep me football up and try and, and get coached as well under a, a coach called Paul Bryson at the time. And he was a really good coach and I really enjoyed working under him. And he kind of got the best out of us, a bit like our manager does now here at Sheffield United. So I knew that if I was going to get coached and enjoy, I needed to find the love of the game a little bit more again because after, after that big disappointment, it was hard to find the love and enjoyment of, of the game again and he, he found that in for me. So how did that come about? Was it a gradual thing or...? or... Yeah, just slowly just started playing football matches and enjoying them again and playing against teams in a, in a, in a competitive league and then, like we say, I had to go and find a job as well and that ended up being at what everyone knows now was at McDonald's. And I also read that you actually kept hold of that McDonald's uniform, is that right? Yeah, so, well, I kept hold of the stars and the cap, uh, <laughs> the caps that my mum's in the loft and I got hold of the stars, just to, just a reminder that I obviously worked there and I achieved some, some things there as well. And it was, it was just a good to have a, something in my life where I knew I had to be there on, on time and a bit of, bit of money coming in as well, because I had a scooter at the time, so I needed to put petrol in that. <laughs> And then at 18, the, the Bolton opportunity came along. Um, do you just explain how that happened? Yeah, so I was playing for the county, Durham County football team, and there was the manager and the staff were, one was a scout for Bolton at the time, and he just, he said to us, uh, before the county, the county game started, was just that, if you keep doing what you're doing, I'm gonna take you down there, and you think, oh, here I go again, and it's back to that situation, all the pressure starts to build up on you, but I just wanted to enjoy it, and then the, the, so the scout there just took us down, we drove down one day and I had a trial, but because I was 18, I couldn't play under 18's football, it had to be reserve, and it was in a reserve league, so I had to go, I had a trial game there, and it was probably the game of my life, uh, I set up a goal and created a few goals as well, and I was developing at the same time, so I became a bit more of a man, and you, you could just see what I was going to be as a footballer at that time. So going into that game as an 18 year old lad and, and what you'd experienced before, were you thinking, you know, this game it's make or break for me or were you kind of more confident by then? No, I was definitely this game's make or break for me because it was Premier League as well. It, was, it wasn't like I was going to a League One or League Two club. This was Premier League, Bolton Wanderers, fighting in Europe, Sam Allardyce, all them great players, Ivan Campo and players like that. And I was playing in the reserves with some really, really talented, talented footballers and I just couldn't wait to, to try and impress and try and create something and I knew as soon as i done that assist and the game just kind of took care of itself after that. So how quickly after that reserve game against Blackburn did you get offered a contract by Sam Allardyce? Yeah, so that was like the end of the season and then the following year I was turning 19 or 18 or 19 and Sam Allardyce wanted to bring us back in again and they gave us a, a contract which was a scholarship contract but I was 19 year old so I had to play reserve football but it was just a contract in front of us and I got my pen out, I couldn't wait and just get a sign so they gave us a year, a year contract and before I knew it I was training with the likes of Gary Speed for Bolton Wanderers and... Kevin Nolan, who I seen last week at West Ham, and just nice just to play, play with them, train with them, and just get get me head around. Whoa, I'm here and I'm playing for Bolton Wanderers. It was it was a bit surreal at the time. Yeah, and I'm guessing you had to knuckle down pretty quickly. And it's amazing how things work out. You made your Premier League debut against Sunderland, didn't you? Age 20. I know you only got on for a few minutes, but how special was that day for you? And at the time, did you realise how big a moment it was? No. Uh, I, I look back now at my age now and I've played all the games that I have and this game was probably the, the the dream game for me to come on, Sunderland, winning 4-1, a, a nice easy one just to go go on, get yourself an appearance in the Premier League, family are all in the stands, I've, my dad was buzzing, everyone was so happy and then I got the opportunity just to play against Sunderland and my me, me Premier League opportunity because it doesn't come around much and a lot of players dream of making it in the Premier League and that was my dream coming true. And over the course of the four years, Chris, I know you only made 19, I think, Premier League appearances, but there were some major moments for you too. And I want to pick out your first Premier League goal against Chelsea. Will that stick in the mind? Yeah, that still sticks in the mind because it's my only one still so far now. And <laughs> I'm trying ever so hard to get one for Sheffield United because that'll be a dream come true as well. But yeah, it was just, just the, the game was just a bit surreal as well. Only Davis to aim at, although Basham is looking to join him. Kevin Davis coming in, and Basham has scored! Well, it really wasn't in the script. And Chris Basham with a moment to savour whatever happens. It was only a couple of years back that uh, 
he was working in McDonald's up in the northeast, having been rejected by Newcastle United. They could have nicked a draw at the end of it all, but you're just playing against, at that time, them players were just unreal, like Drogba and Alga. I was in a great set of, a great team as well, and you look back on it and it's, I just wish I could have stayed longer at Bolton and, instead of moving on to Blackpool, to be honest. So how did that come about, that move? Why did you make that decision? Yeah, I made that decision because Blackpool had just been promoted to the Premier League. I thought it was a great route for me to, to start establishing myself as a Premier League footballer. Like you said, I only made 19, 20 Premier League appearances for, for Bolton one dress, so it was a good chance to go there. But the team was brilliant when I went there. Charlie Adam, David Vaughan were outstanding players in, in my position. So I kind of had to sit back. Then I broke my leg, had a, had a really bad setback there uh, with breaking my leg and not being able to play that year. And we got relegated to the championship and it was back to, back to reality that I was playing football in a league that I'd never played in before. Even though, as you say, that was a, a step down, how much of a career highlight was it playing in the same team as a childhood hero of yours, Kevin Phillips? Yeah, that was, <laughs> that was unbelievable. I was asking him so many questions when he was with us. and I think at that time he was about 36, 37 as well, so he was coming to his end, but his body was just in, a, in, a, in, in great shape and it was just great to be and privileged to play with him, to be honest. Did you have to keep it together a bit and not tell him how much of a fan you were? Yeah, I kind of told him... As I was settling, when he was settling in, and I kind of told him that I was a big Sunderland fan, and I've been watching you for years, and just asking about all the players and just all the memories, and just being part of the stadium of light in Sunderland, and it's still close to his heart now, I'm sure, and I think he would love to be a manager there one day, I'm sure. It's hard to take, and it, we're hurting a lot in the dressing room at the moment, but. We need to try and find some dignity, we need to try and find some form in, in ourselves to try and get out this rut. I want to race forward now to um, 2014, signing for Sheffield United. Um, it seems like you settled really quickly. Did it always have the feel of, of a good fit for you, the club? Yeah, well, me agent at the time, James, was just, if you get that club going, it'll be unbelievable. And he says it might take a while because I've been in League One a while. So I took a step down from the Championship to League One to try and bounce straight away. And it, it took a good two or three years for that to happen. It was a risk for me to go, that, go to Sheffield United, but it's, it's re rewards and it's really paid off, but in 2014 under Nigel Clough, I think we got to a semi-final mm. of, a, of the cup as well, which was amazing. And But to see the fans like they were in their semi-finals, you just know that it was a, a club ready to erupt at the time and just, just getting the right manager at the time was, was just a bit tough to, to, to get to. Well, the right manager did arrive, didn't he, eventually? But people forget, don't they, the hugely challenging start to that season under Chris Wilder and... Is it fair to say that things could have turned out very differently with a couple more losses in his first season? Definitely, I think with with the manager coming in, we never. We I think we had four games on the bounce where we didn't win. So the manager's pulled up at a corner shop and just says, "Lads, go and get yourselves a couple of beers. I think you need them. Try and recover. Try and recover well and be ready for the next game." And then I think we went on a 17-game winning run. And he just kind of once the train started, it wasn't going to get stopped. And the fans started believing, and the whole city and the manager started believing as well that we could actually get out this league finally. Interesting, you mentioned that stopping the coach. Is that a moment where as players you all think, you know, it's a bit of a turning point? It sounds silly, doesn't it, just stopping at a shop after a game? Yeah, but... I think it was one of them ones where he said stop and all the lads look at each other and take a step back and he's like, go and get yourselves a, whatever you want from the shop, a beer or a, a can of Coke, whatever you need. And it was just, just something that... I think needed, he wanted to have team morale and he wanted to have team togetherness and I think that worked a treat and that's why we went on 17, 18 games unbeaten and Billy Sharp started scoring goals. He certainly did and, and you were deployed as a central midfielder at the time. Was, was that, did you need persuading? How did you kind of take that when Chris suggested that's what should happen? Yeah, so at the time he was he had his midfield for the first three or four games and we didn't win one game and then he's he's gone to his I'm thinking about changing the formation and I think this would suit you really well. Your engine's unbelievable, you can get up and down the pitch, you're comfortable on the ball in, in, in a position in that position. Can we give it a go? And that's when he changed to the three five two formation, which obviously famously the the right the centre backs overlapping down the wings and stuff like that. So that's what I do now, that's what I'm carrying on doing now and I'm really enjoying it and I'm, I'm privileged that he chose me to do that, do this role. So how quickly after that turnaround did um, 
you know, you all realise that you're onto something pretty special here. And as your agent said, you know, the club will just have that momentum and go and go and go. Yeah, well, as soon as we, we got to, we won the League One title uh, with 100 points, the manager said, right, we can do it again in the Championship. The Championship, we started really well. We were right up there and we just drifted off near the end. And I think that's when the manager took a step back. He knew what we needed. And then the year after, he brought in experience, brought in lads that knew the league a bit more. Uh, he wanted to bring in creativity as well, which he did do. And yeah, like you say, the club just went and the fans were all together having open top buses. And I've enjoyed every moment of the success we've had. And obviously right now we're having a, a really tough spell and it's, it's not enjoyable, but this is what happens in football. You have to take the good with the bad. Just before we, we get on to the here and now, the, the fairy tale story continued and amazingly so, finishing ninth in the Premier League. Um, you were players and supporters player of the year. I mean, memories that will just stick with you forever, won't they? Yeah, definitely memories and trophies that I can hold and cherish forever and show me children as well. Uh, I was privileged last year to play so well and do, uh, do ever so well in the Premier League and uh, to finish ninth and keep as clean, many clean sheets as we did uh, for a newly promoted side was, was quite, quite unbelievable, to be honest. And a lot of the lads were over overwhelmed by everything because we thought the Premier League was going to be as, as tough as it is, but which we're <laughs> realising now. Uh, but yeah, that was just an amazing season, and to get the personal accolades to go along with it was uh, was was great. Did you surprise yourselves in a way? Did you kind of look around and go, "Wow, this is this is going pretty well, lads," and you know, how, is this is this going to keep up? Did it just carry on going through the season? I think, like like we, we said, the momentum thing and the fans and all things all thing good that you wanted possibly going for you was going for you. No injuries and just momentum. The fans were carrying us through and really enjoying being in the Premier League and and then lockdown happened and I think it's we just a lot of us and players in the club just haven't really fully recovered from from this period and not having fans there is a is a massive factor for us as a I see ourselves as working men uh, we, we're lads that have worked the way back to where we need to be and and I think we're finding it a little bit tough right now. Do you go along with that, you know, the, the second season syndrome thing and everyone else knowing much more about you, that kind of thing? Yeah, definitely. I think, obviously, our staff, they are from 9 to 5, so you, you do so much homework on a team and we were the surprise package last year, so teams have obviously must have thought, we need to look into this, we need to, to find a way of beating Sheffield United and the second season syndrome, I don't like saying it, but it, look, it's, it's, it looks like it's happened to us now and it's, it's hard to take and it, we're hurting a lot in the dressing room at the moment, but... We need to try and find some dignity. We need to try and find some form in, in ourselves to, to try and get out this rut. And looking at those results, it, is it even more frustrating in a way that, you know, no one's really put four or five past you, have they? And, and the vast majority of your losses have been by a single goal in, in low scoring games. Yeah, that's, I think that's one thing. I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing, but we just, we, we, we walk away from the game and we're like one nil again, or it's a two one. We, and it's against the best teams in the league. It's, it's, it's really, uh, it's really, really hard to take when, when, when them results are coming in like they are. And then it's, it's just one of them things. Yeah, I think we'll have to work from it. We, are, we definitely need to learn from this year. We need to learn from, obviously, the lockdown period of why. And we need to learn from just personal performances as well. And are we doing the right things away from the ground? You do have the small matter of an FA Cup quarter final on the horizon. You know, certainly something to remain positive about over these next few weeks. Yeah, I think the last two years, two quarterfinals is not a disappointment. It's it's something that now we really need to focus on and I'm hoping to be available for that game. Uh, the lads will hopefully have a chance of playing at Wembley because I've never done that before. I'm 33, 30, coming up 33 now, so this could be my final chance to get to Wembley. So it's really exciting if we can do that. And despite all the difficulties this season, do you see this group you know, staying together and, and doing everything possible to, to get back and have, have another crack at the Premier League should the worst happen? Yeah, I think the, the manager will definitely be here and he'll be wanting to keep the team together. We're, I think having the cup runs, when we're playing against a few championship sides in that as well, we kind of know that we're going to be there or thereabouts next year if we do go down. So we've just got to keep pushing. The fans will hopefully come back. They'll all be on side. And I feel for them because they've only had six months of Premier League football. So hopefully we can give them a bit more in, in the future. And for you personally, Chris, you're, you know, as you say, you're 32 now almost 300 appearances for the club, but there still must be dreams and you know, ambitions that you still want to achieve. Yeah, definitely. Obviously, short term, can we stay in the Premier League, which is going to be really tough. Uh, medium term, I think we need to, to focus, re regroup again next year and try and push 
for, for, for the Premier League in the long term, just carry on playing the best football. I think it's helped being a late developer. I think if you look at development, me developing so late and I feel, still feel really strong and good and powerful and I think that's helped me along the way. So just stay fit, fit as I can and keep pushing the young lads with me as well. But the manager called you the, the fittest man in the squad by a country mile, is that accurate? Yeah, on, on long distance running, yeah. I think this the last few years I've had to really focus on my sharpness and strength because the Premier League is so, so uh, explosive. Uh, so I've had to focus on that a lot. So just keep keep going. And the manager, yeah, I'm the fittest in the team for long distance running. I have been for a while, so keep that going. And as you say, the, the late developer thing, I, do you get the feeling you know, that you're making up for lost time a little bit? Is that how, how it feels for you? Yeah, definitely. And I think that's why I can play nearly every game in every in every season. I think it's making up for lost time. And people talk about prime coming into your prime and stuff. But if you develop at a different time, your your prime is a, probably the last couple of years I've really hit hit me peak in in, in my football calibre. And hopefully, I can keep on going and keep performing and keep consistent. I think that's the main thing. And you're very much living proof of the unpredictability of being a, a, a professional footballer, aren't you? Playing in all five tiers. You know, it's not probably the route you imagined, but looking back at it now, would you would you change anything? No, definitely not. I think uh, the only thing I probably would have changed is just listen to it, listen and to advice a little bit more of of my managers and should I've gone on loan there, should I've done this move, should I've stayed. And obviously, as you get older, you learn these things and you learn about your your regrets and you learn about the things that you shouldn't have done and you learn about all the good things that you've done and enjoyment that you've had in the game and long may it continue. And if you didn't get that letter when you were 16 years old that your dad read out to you, do you think you'd be a different player, that, that things would have been completely different for you if you followed a different route? Yeah, I think you, you always wanted to make it, I always wanted to make it at the club that, uh, that produced us really, that gave us that chance of producing. That didn't happen. I'm very disappointed that it didn't happen and I love going back in Newcastle now and proving them wrong that they shouldn't have got rid of us but yeah you learn you learn all the way through football I'm still learning now and you just got to carry on and hopefully that learning what I'm doing now can take us into the future if I do become a coach or if I do want to be in that uh, that manager's chair. So just on that are you, are you someone who thinks about life after football or are you someone who just wants to play until you know you possibly can and take every last ounce of your you know ability? Yeah, I think I'll definitely play as long as I can because I love playing and everyone tells you once you finish football it'll be the biggest change in your life. So I'm learning on the go. I, I want to keep playing as long as I can but I also need to know I also need to know in the back of my head that I will be wanting to do something in the football game, either punditry or I think I'll always have to have that that jab of football in my life. And as you've matured, Chris, and you know become a, a, a senior player at Sheffield United, are you someone who's embraced that leadership? Do you look to kind of influence the younger players? Is that something that comes naturally to you? Yeah, definitely, and times are changing a lot at the moment. Obviously, the social media side of things, learning from that, and just just giving lads the little grip of the Sheffield United way, and obviously when the fans come back, just to how, how to obviously deal with all that situation. And we've got a, young lad, a lot of young lads coming through who are really impressing us at the moment, and hopefully they can be the spark next year and grip, grip, grip the game by both hands. And that Sheffield United way that you, you mentioned, it's probably quite hard to you know, explain. How would you describe what that is to anyone who's, who's, who's never heard it before? It's just obviously 100% commitment. Uh, wear, wear, the heart, wear your heart on your sleeve for, for the badge and you'll be loved for the rest of your life at the club. And I think that's the main thing. The, that's all the fans want to see. They know if you give everything that you, you've got a really good chance of making it at Sheffield United. And for you, Chris, personally, how would you like to be remembered? You know, when you're looking back at it all, you've got your feet up, not just as a footballer at Sheffield United, but you know, as a person who's who's had a career in the game. Yeah, definitely. I think obviously the overlapping wing backs becoming a big thing in football now. So if I can be remembered as one of them, the Chris Basham role, that'll be great. And it's it's nice to hear that when I hear that. So yeah, just and from the fans' point of view, just be remembered as a as a, a player that came in League One and got promoted to the Premier League and just give everything he's got and he always will. And that's the kind of players that they like and that's the player that I hope you be remembered as. Well, Chris, we look forward to you know, seeing what's next in your story and um, thanks very much and best of luck for the rest of the season. Thanks very much. Bye.